Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you for joining us for another installment of our video PowerPoint series for Unit 6, DNA, RNA, and Protein Synthesis. Today, what we're going to be talking about primarily is DNA, its structure, and a little bit of the history that came into, well, determining what DNA was, as well as what it looked like. So, without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. I will see you all on the next slide. So the definition of DNA. DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. It's a molecule that contains genetic information that directs the activity of all of our cells. DNA also contains the instructions cells use to make proteins. So they carry the blueprints that allow our body to create the proteins that we need to survive. So these proteins allow us to help make new bones, muscle, new cells, and a wide variety of other things inside of our body. So all in all, it's kind of important. So the history of DNA. The first person we need to discuss is a woman by the name of Rosalind Franklin. She went ahead and took x-ray pictures of DNA molecules which helped to determine its shape. So what she did was she actually took an x-ray of the cell and found this kind of X-like shape, which led to the discovery that uh, DNA has a double helix or kind of like a spiraling ladder type shape. So if you look down here on the right, this is what she saw. So as you can see, it's kind of got this spiral-like pattern. So we see that it comes down like this, other side comes down like this, and this is expected to continue. So it gives us this real nice spiraling helix pattern. The next two we need to discuss are gentlemen by the name of James Watson and Francis Crick, who went ahead and built the first DNA model. And they're usually given credit for determining its shape. So they determined that it's a series of bases, all gone ahead and put together with a few bits of phosphate and uh, sugar. So, what happens is, they actually used a photo that Rosalind Franklin took to create this model. So even though they're given credit for determining its shape, it's all kind of on the backbone or the uh, shoulders of Rosalind Franklin. The structure. DNA is made up of monomers called nucleotides. So if you think back, we actually talked about nucleotides during the biochem unit. But a nucleotide is composed of three different parts. We have a sugar, in this case deoxyribose, a phosphate, and a nitrogen base. So when you actually see a nucleotide, it's going to look something like this. So as you can see, we have our phosphate, we have our sugar, and we have our nitrogen base. So DNA is actually just a, a, just a kind of chain of these going ahead and linking together. So the structure of DNA continued here. There are four different DNA nitrogen bases. We have the purines, which contain adenine and guanine. These are the double ring structures. So as you can see here on the right, they're composed of two different carbon rings. Now what we also have are the pyrimidines. The pyrimidines include cytosine and thymine, and what these are, are primarily single ring structures. Now this is going to come in handy when we start talking about how the uh, nitrogen bases actually bond with each other. Now we can't have a set of bonds that have four over, then two, so this is why your purines always go ahead and bond with your pyrimidines. That way we have a nice even three the entire way down. So nitrogen bases always bond to the deoxyribose molecule, or the sugar of the nucleotide. So as you can see here, once again, we have our phosphate, we have our sugar, and we have our nitrogen base. And just like it said above, the sugar right here is always bonding to the nitrogen base. Nucleotides bond together to form a double-stranded DNA molecule. 
So the DNA structure actually looks a bit like a twisted ladder, like somebody took a ladder by both rungs and just went ahead and twisted a little bit. This structure is what we call a double helix. The deoxyribose and phosphate form the rails of the ladder. So the sugar and the phosphate are going to be our backbones. So, if we looked at a ladder, our sugar and phosphate would be the rungs. Whereas the nitrogen bases go ahead and create the rungs or the steps of the ladder. So like we said before, what we have are the deoxyribose and the phosphates, which are the rails, and then we have our nitrogen bases, which go ahead and form the rungs. Very similar to this structure we have drawn right up here. So like we said, the structure of the DNA. We've got our backbone made of alternating sugars and phosphates, and we have our nucleotide, which goes ahead and connects the rungs of the ladder. Now, are you noticing a pattern here? Think about it. What seems to be combining with what? If you notice, the C's always combine with the G's. So the guanine always combines with the cytosine as well as the adenine, or A, always combines with thymine. So real quickly, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to go ahead and discuss the uh, discoveries of a man by the name of Edwin Chargoff. He's the one, down here, who created what we know as Chargoff's Rule. So if you think back to the last slide, you saw that A was always pairing up with T, and vice versa, and C was always pairing up with G. Well, Chargoff noticed this too, and decided to document it. What he discovered was that adenine will always bond with thymine, and vice versa. And that guanine would always bond to cytosine. So that is the discovery of Edwin Chargoff, this dapper, dapper individual down below who looks very confident. So nitrogen base pairing rules. Like we said before, adenine will always bond to thymine. Whereas cytosine will always bond to guanine. So the nitrogen bases are bonded together with weak hydrogen bonds to hold the two DNA strands together. The structure and shape of the nitrogen bases always allow them to bond to their complement. So the way the structure and shape of the DNA works is that A is always going to pair up with T, and G is always going to pair up with C. No matter which way you slice it, that's always how it's going to work. Because as you can see here, we have our adenine, which has two rung, uh, not two rungs, sorry, two uh, rings, and thymine has one, and vice versa. We have our guanine, which has two rings, and our cytosine, which has one. So this way we always get a very nice, even set of rungs between the latter. So, let's think back here. The picture to the right shows an X-ray diffraction of DNA. The X-ray diffraction of DNA led to the idea that DNA has a what type of shape? That would be a double helix. And if you remember, Rosalind Franklin is the one that took the picture. So when asked the question, why are Watson and Crick famous? Basically what they did, if you remember correctly, is they went ahead and used Rosalind Franklin's picture to create the first correct model of DNA. So, what we have here, let's play a little guessing game, shall we? So we know that C always goes to G. So if we have a G on the left, that means we have a what? A C, right. If we have an A, that means the A is going to bond with the T. And if we have a T, T is going to bond to A. So a nucleotide, which can be found right here, in this square, a nucleotide always consists of a phosphate, a sugar, and a base. So we have our phosphate, we have our sugar, 
And we have our nitrogen base. Three parts, all composing a nucleotide. So, if you go ahead and label the sugars S and the phosphates P, you should notice a pattern. So we would have P, S, P, S, let's go to the other side, S, P, then S and P again. Do you see a pattern? If you look, the sugars and phosphates are always running in the opposite direction of one another. So in order to make uh, the order of the nucleotides creates the code used to make proteins. So the arrangement of nitrogen bases A to T and C to G determines the amino acids that will be used to uh, construct the proteins. Kind of like how the alphabet makes words. So the big question here is how does this all fit? So all your DNA end to end is about two meters long. So if this is about a meter, imagine two of those. That's going to be, oh, I'd say somewhere short of eight feet. Now, a cell's nucleus is about two micrometers in diameter. So what that means is, how can we fit two meters of DNA into a space that's only two micrometers? So just to give you a heads up, two micrometers would be 0 0.00002 meters. Pretty tiny. So how can we fit all that DNA into such a tiny space? Well, hang tight, because I'm going to tell you. What we do is we supercoil it. So first step is the DNA wraps around something called a histone protein, which can be found right here. So the DNA goes ahead and wraps around a histone. When we go ahead and wrap the DNA around a histone, so when we have DNA and a histone, we call that a nucleosome. So here we have our nucleosomes. The nucleosomes then go ahead and form a coil. So first we coil the DNA around the protein, then we coil the nucleosomes again. So we have two coils so far. After that, the coil then coils upon itself once more, like illustrated up here. So basically we have a coil made of coils made of more coils. So we have three coils deep. It's like coilception. So supercoiling is actually what gives a chromosome its kind of blurry looking shape. So if you went ahead and actually zoomed in on a piece of a chromosome, you would see that it's made of all of this supercoiled DNA. So much like a phone cord, now I know back in the day, yes, believe it or not, phones had cords. Some still do. The way they got to go ahead and get the phone cord, the big problem was, okay, let's say your phone was in one room, but you had to be in another. The trick was they coiled the cord. So if you coil the cord, you can fit a lot more cord, uh, a lot more cord into a very small amount of space. Very similar to supercoiling. So again, if we think back, what is a chromosome? I'll give you a sec. A chromosome is nothing more than supercoiled DNA. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that about goes ahead and does it for today. Thank you very much for joining us for our video PowerPoint here on DNA. So in conclusion, what we talked about was DNA, or deoxyribonucleic acid, what it's responsible for, going ahead and controlling the cell, as well as containing our genetic material. We talked about Rosalind Franklin and Watson Crick, with their uh, discoveries for what DNA was, we also discussed what DNA is made of. So DNA is made of nucleotides, and nucleotides are composed of three different parts. 
we have a nitrogen base, a 5 carbon sugar, and a phosphate. And our nitrogen bases include adenine, which always bonds to thymine, and guanine, which always bonds to cytosine. Well, I'd like to thank you all again for joining us, and until next time, I will see you in the next video. You all keep it classy.